session 3 of our scientific program which is respiratory critical care. It is specialized field which focuses on patients suffering from injuries and diseases of respiratory system which includes lungs, trachea, diaphragm and related structures. I invite Dr. Yagnank Vyas who is consultant pulmonologist N.D. Desai Hospital, Nadiad, on the dais. I also invite Dr. Harendra Thakkar, who is consultant intensivist and pulmonologist, Shalbi Hospital, Ahmedabad. Now I invite Dr. Neil Thakkar, consultant intensivist and pulmonologist, Sterling Hospital, Vadodara. And lastly, I invite Dr. Satish Patel, Professor and Head, Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Pramukh Swami Medical College, Karamsad, to chair this session. ARDS or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome is a heterogeneous disorder associated with disease processes which lead to acute lung injury, decreased compliance and severe hypoxemia. Associated mortality remains increased in spite of significant advances. To know what works and what does not in ARDS, let me invite Dr. Srinivas Samavedam for his talk on eight mandates in 8th Gujarat Criticon for ARDS management. Please, sir. At the outset, I'm extremely grateful to the organizing team here for giving me yet another opportunity of participating in this exciting annual Gujarat Criticon. Every time I come here, I see the enthusiasm and the full house, which actually motivates the speakers as well. The topic I have been asked to speak about is about the eight mandates for ARDS management in the eighth Criticon, Gujarat Criticon. Now, when I say a mandate, I would say something that mandatorily, mandatorily you have to uh, follow or where there is unequivocal evidence that there is either benefit or harm. So the first mandate which came about 20 years ago which all of us now religiously follow in the management of ARDS is the, is the use of appropriate tidal volumes. Now this is one of the earliest studies which also brought into focus the importance of the cytokine storm that happens in patients with ARDS. So the first study that was published, this was way back in the year 2000, in the year 2000 when I graduated from in internal medicine, where we were taught that use of tidal volumes greater than 10 mils per kilogram of ideal body weight is very harmful and in a cohort of about 900 patients it was one of the largest studies on ARDS at that point of time which showed that a lung protective ventilation strategy targeting 6 to 8 mils per kilogram ideal body weight of tidal volume actually reduces mortality and does not cause any worsening of partial pressures of oxygen or carbon dioxide. So the first mandate is that do not exceed 8, milli, 8 mils per kilogram ideal body weight of tidal volume for all your patients with ARDS if your outcomes have to be successful. Close on the heels of this publication, a couple of years later, the ARMA trial came into picture, which also looked at a very important and very confusing aspect of the management of ARDS, and that's the administration of PEEP. In those days, people used to ventilate patients with PEEPs of more than 20 if the ARDS is very bad and the oxygenation was not uh, maintained. Of course, in those days, prone ventilation was not recognized. We didn't have extracorporeal support. And to say uh, in a mild term, the ventilators we were using in those days did not have the kind of sensitivity which the current ventilators have. But still, this was one of the landmark trials which emphasized the fact that you could have three populations of alveoli in the same patient at the same time. You could have the ones which are optimally ventilated with optimum PEEP. And you could have alveoli which are collapsed, which are de-recruited 
which will contribute to the hypoxemic vasoconstriction and the other attendant complications. And you also have the other population of over-distended alveoli which trigger barotrauma, atelectrauma and probably other injuries associated with uh, injurious strategies of mechanical ventilation. So a high PEEP versus low PEEP strategy was the next thing that was studied in the ARMA trial from the NHI ArtsNet group and they brought into focus this important thing which we still follow at this point of time that is the peep the FiO2 peep table which even some, which is even followed to this day this study which included close to 350 patients in each arm concluded that in patients with ARDS a high peep strategy does not improve survival right now you know that an optimum peep strategy improves survival but in those days it was actually a, a path breaker or a game changer which said that do not ventilate patients with a peep of more than 14 and that's what we continue, we now begin to accept as routine practice in the current era. Something that was very similar to what I spoke about in terms of tidal volumes and PEEP, which put some method into the way we understand where mechanical ventilation and put some science into the way the alveoli are opened and closed during ventilation, came with the third mandate which we have to follow now is what is called as driving pressure. Now this driving pressure is now considered as the marker that your ventilation strategy, your peep strategy or your tidal volume strategy or your plateau pressure setting are actually winning the battle for you. So the survival of patients who were ventilated where the driving pressure was less than 20 and more close to 16 millimeters of mercury was found to be better, found to be superior to those patients whose driving pressures were, were more than 20. So this was of course a, a smaller study compared to the tidal volume and the PEEP studies but the impact it made on the strategies. So you don't know, you no longer just target the plateau pressure and PEEP and leave the ventilation as it is. You actually see whether your stepping up of your PEEP actually increases your driving pressure or decreases your driving pressure. An incremental PEEP that actually reduces your driving pressure is probably your working PEEP or your effective PEEP. So once you increase the PEEP, if the driving pressure stops falling or starts rising, that is harmful PEEP to your patient. So bringing in the first two mandates of tidal volume and optimum PEEP, combine it with a strategy that is driven by a driving pressure appears to be the safest way of ventilating patients with moderate to severe ARDS. So in this study, a driving pressure of less than 15 was found to be the most accurate ventilatory variable uh, those to identify those patients who are at risk of volume trauma and atelect trauma. And this delta P of more than 15 was associated with lower survival. So it gave us a number to play around with on mechanical ventilation. Something which we used to do as trainees way back in 2002-2004 when I was a critical care trainee was to recruit patients with PEEP and pressure when the hypoxemia was very uh, bad or we were pushed to the wall. Does it actually work? The fourth mandate is about recruitment. Do you recruit patients any, anymore? Do, do, does it work? Now the study which actually brought recruitment into focus and also un told us what needs to be done and what need not be done is the far lab study permissive hypercapnia and alveolar recruitment in uh, moderate to severe ARDS in this study a age old concept of recruiting patients in those days if we had prone the patient and we had not recruited him our chief would have actually blasted us off for not doing the right thing for the patient after proning. They would say that the benefits of prone ventilation are lost if you don't recruit a patient. But the far lab study showed that those patients who are recruited actually do worse over a long period of time. It's not to say that recruitment fails, but it should not be applied as a mandatory tool for every patient with mod moderate to se severe ARDS and that's the fourth mandate we need to remember. So as I mentioned, prone ventilation. Prone ventilation actually, if you look at it, it's an evolutionary aspect. We all evolved as four-legged animals. So the back side of our lungs actually has the highest population of alveoli which have the biggest blood supply. So the density of vascular alveoli is more at the back. When we started walking on two legs, that aspect became the back of the lung. 
now when you when you are in trouble you tend to flip the patient's prone to achieve something called as remodeling or shape adjustment of the alveoli so if you have an isolated lung which is healthy all the alveoli are quite happy and spherical in uh, contour so if you in, in the supine position when the fluid the exudative fluid of ARDS fills the lungs the bases gets collapsed but these are the alveoli which have the highest number of blood capillary density where, where the perfusion is going in but they are not getting in the oxygenation so to capitalize on it you flip the patient's prone and you get the advantage of the uh, remodeling over a period of time the shape matching so gravity actually fills those alveoli which don't have too much of blood supply. So you end up getting a better compliance, a lower driving pressure and a better VQ uh, ratio if you prone patients with ventilation. So while this was an evolutionary and physiological concept, it only came into prominence and people started accepting it as a standard of care after the publication of the PRO-SEVA study in 2013. The PRO-SEVA study Previous to the publication of this particular study, patients used to be prone for four hours. They used to be prone for six hours. And then you find, you don't find an improvement at six hours. You used to flip them supine and then give up on the patient said, we have prone the patient, he didn't improve, so it's God's wish that he dies. But that's not true. What the ProSeva study said is that while emphasizing that prone ventilation actually works, the ProSeva study actually put a number into the minimum number of hours you should be proning these patients. And they said anything that is less than 16 hours is not going to be effective and you could do multiple sessions of over three to four days of proning to get optimum benefit from prone ventilation. So if you look at the ProSeva study, it looked at close to 500 patients, 250 in each arm, and they looked at ventilator-free days within 28 days, successful liberation from ventilation, tracheostomy and 28-day mortality, and found better extubation rates, better time, quicker time off the ventilator, and better survival for prolonged periods of proning repeated over several days in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. So that was the fifth mandate uh, we, we need to remember. Now, that is, these are all ventilatory strategies. We also now need to look at non-ventilatory strategies because mechanical ventilation in ARDS is a combination of ventilatory and non-ventilatory strategies. And one of the strategies which puts these patients into trouble is your fluid balance, your fluid strategy. So the sixth mandate which we need to remember is what should be your fluid balance in patients with ARDS. And this question was answered by the FACT trial in the year 2006 which said, which compared in a catheter-based, a central line and a pulmonary art artery catheter-based study, looked at the positive fluid balance in patients who died versus patients who did not, who survived, and patients whose plateau pressures were lower compared to those whose plateau pressures were higher, and concluded that in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, a positive fluid balance of more than a liter after the first 24 hours of resuscitation results in worst outcomes if they have moderate to severe ARDS. So meticulous attention to the fluid balance, your fluid charts, your intake output charts on a daily basis or maybe on an hourly basis is something we all need to learn as a habit for better outcomes among patients with moderate to severe ARDS. The other non-ventilatory strategy which came and went, came and went, a uh, lot of people liked it, some people did not like it, was neuromuscular blockade. Do you paralyze your patients with, uh, all your patients with uh, ARDS with long, uh, neuromuscular blockade for a long period of time? The accuracy study attempted to see whether neuromuscular blockade is good for patients or not. And the accuracy study showed a survival advantage at the end of 28 days for those patients who received cisatracurium infusion for the first 48 hours after being ventilated for moderate to severe ARDS. And this sort of set the tone for people using it as standard practice. But again, after a few years after it became standard practice, the rose petal study actually showed that it does not actually confer advantage among all patients, but if your patient is having a severe ARDS with refractory hypoxemia requiring PEEP of more than 12 and repeated sessions of prone ventilation, that is the subset of patients who will improve with 
continuous infusion of neuromuscular blockade not exceeding 48 hours. So that is the mandate we have. Use it in a selected set of patients. Use it for a short period of time. Get your ventilator strategies right in that 48 hours in which you are using neuromuscular blockade. That was the seventh mandate we need to remember. And the last one which came into prominence in the last three years is about your oxygen targets. Now people are enamored by this less is more in intensive care, right? You give less fluid, you give uh, less blood transfusions, you use antibiotics for a shorter period of time. So that analogy came into oxygen targets as well. So do we give to keep everybody above 95%? Do we keep everybody's PAO2 above 80%? So a lot of trials were published, the oxygen ICU, the hot ICU, the, uh, the LOT study, several, IC, several ICU rock study, several studies were published on conservative oxygen targets among critically ill patients. Now the end of the uh, discussion, the story is, if you try to put conservative oxygen strategies for severe ARDS patients, that means whose PAO2 is less than 60 and who's FIO2 at an FIO2 of more than 80, they tend to die. So while conservative oxygen therapy targets are good for a general population of critically ill patients, it may not be the target for you to follow in a critically ill patients with moderate to severe ARDS. So if you want to use an oxygen strategy, try to keep the PAO2 above 70 for moderate severe ARDS and the saturation above 92. This is what we can conclude from all the ox conservative oxygen studies which were published. Do not attempt to have a PAO2 of 60 and a saturation of 85 for severe ARDS unless you are contemplating extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for these patients. So in summary, I would say the eight mandates, if I can put it into one paragraph or one sentence or one phrase, a low tidal volume and optimum strat PEEP strategy guided by a driving pressure of less than 15, supplemented by a conservative fluid balance, reinforced by prone ventilation with selected use of neuromuscular blockade while avoiding over-enthusiastic recruitment and conservative oxygen target seems to be the ideal way of managing patients with severe ARDS. So these are my eight mandates put in a nutshell for all your patients with ARDS. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of it. Any questions? So, uh, thank you so much, sir, for guiding with uh, so uh, good uh, evidence-based practical principles in managing ARDS. I just had one uh, question that uh, uh, in the last week in uh, October, uh, recently Lancet has published a review regarding ARDS diagnostics and therapeutics. So one of the things that they are saying is uh, inflammation. So if there is a, a hyperinflammatory ARDS and hypoinflammatory ARDS, so does changing uh, what they mentioned is that if you are using a high PEEP strategy for a hyperinflammatory ARDS versus a low, uh, does it improve uh, prognostication in any way in terms of managing critically ill ARDS patients? Yeah, so this is not something that's come out of the blue. Uh, the first study which I showed about conservative tidal volumes, this was 23 years ago, that study actually did bronchoalveolar lavage of all patients with high tidal volumes and showed 23 years ago that interleukin-6 tumor necrosis factor alpha levels are high in bronchoalveolar lavage of patients ventilated with high tidal volumes. So one. High tidal volumes actually causes a lot of cytokine release, first of all. Second thing that we realized is that atelect trauma, that means repeated collapsing and reopening of your alveoli causes biotrauma. That means it causes shearing uh, stress between the interalveolar interface and causes cytokine release is something we have understood. Now what this publication actually brings into focus is that while we have focused on tidal volume, PEEP, driving pressure, and all these paraphernalia, we have forgotten about respiratory rate, right? And that's an important determinant of the lung injury that happens. So why does it happen? You are con when the lung is collapsed, there is potential energy. When you open it, it con gets converted into kinetic energy, and energy is never lost. It is dissipated to some other structure. So the, the faster you ventilate your lungs, greater is the energy that is dissipated to the lung that's called as lung power. Now that's something which has come into focus. So 
this is the entire philosophy behind what we were told is called patient self-induced lung injury. It does not only happen in spontaneously breathing patients, it also, when patients are ventilated with a low tidal volume strategy, they build up carbon dioxide. What happens is because of this permissive hypercapnia strategy, you, you sometimes panic when the CO2 crosses 80 and try to overventilate this patient with a respiratory rate of 30 and 35. When you do that, the energy that is dissipated to the lung increases and the lung injury actually worsens. So this is probably the explanation given for what I think can, we can give for the inflammatory response associated with mechanical ventilation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas Samavedam.